Morning everyone. Today I thought I would do a, another wash and talk video with the BMW i4 behind me here. Talk a little bit about what happened with the with the Macan, a little bit about this car and just my overall feelings uh, after about a year now of daily driving an EV of what I think of them and moving forward how I uh, foresee the stable changing with, with time. I've been driving this car daily for about, uh, well since I got rid of the Taycan, so about a little over two months. I'd say when I first got this car, it was you know I'd only ever had driven the the Taycan, the Turbo S, and then my Cross Turismo, so this was something new for me. And even though I only drove it home from the dealership to the toy box here because I was driving the Taycan as my daily at the time, I was really excited to start driving this car. So over the last month or so, I've put out about a thousand miles, and I've I've learned a little bit more about EVs and how temperamental they can be in the winter time. Some people have experience with that some do not so i can share what my experience has been so far but first i need to rinse this thing down and then i will start washing her up then we can clean it from there as i always do start with the wheel Pop that a little bit i might as well talk about what products i'm using too this is adam's wheel and tire cleaner it's a all-in-one where it cleans the rubber of the tire and it helps break down some of the brake dust on the wheels I used to use a like two different chemicals. You know, one that was specifically designed for tires, one that was specifically designed for the wheel, but this became a little bit too I don't know, I just I found the one that we can use like an all-in-one, I just decided to use that and it's from Adam, so it's I know it's gonna be good stuff. I'm really happy with it. Cleans up the rubber really well. I just use a tire brush and then I have this four finger lamp skin bit that I use for the wheel itself. Okay, so let's we'll talk about this car a little bit. This is a 2023 BMW i4 that I traded the Macan in on, if you guys remember that. I'm a huge Porsche fanboy, always have been, always will be. And that's why I've had you know a lot of Porsches from Cayennes to Caymans, 911s. Tycon, things like that. So, you know, I always thought I'd have like a Porsche as like a daily driver, which is why I got that Tycon, because as times change, you know, so are the vehicles. And I saw this thing get released, to get teased, and then get released. And I immediately contacted my local BMW dealer and built one, just on speculation. And I decided that after about a year of driving the Macan, that I would sacrifice that one to trade in because of my experience with driving the Taycan Turbo S. So we got that Taycan, I gotta I got back up a little bit here. We got that Taycan Turbo S and I drove that for uh, a majority of the summer. And then Porsche came out with their Cross Turismo version, which I thought suited my needs better because I, I need like cargo room and space in the back for kids and dogs. So I ended up trading the, what was it at the time? It was the Challenger and the BMW X6 in on an allocation for the, uh, what was it, for the Taycan, which took about, about seven or eight months to get in. As I was waiting for the Taycan Cross Turismo to come in, I drove around in that Macan, which was fine, because I didn't want to drive something like the Taycan in the wintertime anyway. It was expensive and just whatever. I just waited for that thing to come in, so I just drove the Macan around. And you guys know Macans. They're not cheap cars, but they're not terribly expensive cars either, so I didn't feel as bad driving that versus something expensive like the Taycan. So, uh, Tycon came in, and that's when I started to become not obsessed, but I really enjoyed EVs for uh, after driving that more than I thought that I would. So, not having issues with the, with the Macan, but there's things about it that I didn't really care for. I think it was underpowered for its size. It's a small SUV. But I do. I still think that I had the Macan S, so it wasn't like you know the GTS or the Turbo or anything like that. 
but I do feel like it was underpowered. For example, I would uh, they have to merge into even like something as silly as like a roundabout. And the Macan, for whatever reason, there was this delay. It's like it waited for it to downshift and the turbos would spool up before it would accelerate. So a few times, it was really strange, a few times I caught myself like cutting people off, it seemed. I, I probably, it probably wasn't that bad, but I felt like I was cutting people off because I was like, all right, I'm going to commit to turning now. And I would commit to it, you know, I'd step on the accelerator and nothing would happen for what seemed like, it seemed like a long time, but it was probably two seconds, which I guess is a long time when it comes to driving because that's, you know, I've reacted already in the car, I'm just waiting for the car to keep up, to catch up, I should say. That happened one too many times. And that's when I decided, I was like, all right, I need, keep in mind, I was spoiled at this time from driving EVs, meaning the Taycan, because uh, that's, what, that's, that's what we had in the stable. I was already used to the instant response and no delay of an EV. So I was like, all right, I'm not gonna be driving this Macan anymore. I'd already owned it for a year. Tabs are coming up due on it. And I was like, this is a good time to, a good time to trade around. I wasn't unhappy with it, but it wasn't something that I was extremely happy with. I probably wouldn't buy another one unless it was at a higher trim level with, with faster, uh, with more power. I mean. So I contacted BMW and um, that happened to be a good time because that's when this thing just finally got announced. And I had to wait a little bit to get an allocation, but they finally got me one and I was like, all right, we'll trade in the Macanon on this. So we come up with a good trade in value for the Macan. wasn't bad. I've gotten worse from cars that were a year old. And we ended up specking out this i4. This is uh, something that I put together myself, obviously, the color, the options. I thought it suited me the best. And while we waited for this to come in, that's when I pre-traded with the Macan. What that means is that they, they get a bid, or they I think they took it themselves, actually, after they came up with the agreed price. And they basically took my trade-in before the, the new vehicle came into stock, which forced me to then use the, the Taycan Cross Turismo as a daily driver. This guy took about, uh, probably about eight months to get in, something like that. So that gave me time to really enjoy the Taycan, and I really did enjoy it. So much that I was getting really excited for this car to come in. And so while I was driving the Taycan, you know, I was, I was washing it. I'd film a little bit of that. And I think I mentioned in one of the videos that there's just some things that I didn't necessarily care for about it. I wish it had more power. I don't know why, I'd, I don't know why Porsche even bothers putting out a car with not, you know, peak performance. They charge a lot of money for their cars. That Taycan was more expensive than this, for example. And this thing was, this thing was much faster. It seems like it controls a lot better too. Which brings us to my next point. Drove that Taycan for about, uh, well, tabs were due on it now, so actually I, I owned that car for a little under a year. It was like 11 months and three weeks, actually, to the day. And I ended up putting uh, a little under 3,000 miles on it. I don't drive a whole lot, I just drive to work and back, and we have a bunch of other cars within the stable that kind of help share the abuse, you know, so my daily driver doesn't get as much use as a as a normal car because as a normal person driving because a I don't drive that far and b we have you know, 20 other cars on the stable so it all just kind of shared. But the Taycan being my main one for of of a year probably mainly for about eight months during that year um, it only got. Did, like I said, about 3,000 miles on it. And during that 3,000 miles, you know, I found things that I really enjoyed about it, things that I didn't necessarily care for. While using that, I was waiting for this thing to come in. So, just to recap, traded the Macan in on this. Actually, to recap, traded the Challenger, the Hellcat, which ended up, I think I told you guys, ended up getting stolen out of the Porsche parking lot, like, I don't know, two weeks after I traded it. 
ended up trading that and a uh, 2021 BMW X6 M50 in on the Taycan. Once the Taycan came in, obviously I drove that for a while and back up. While I was waiting for the Taycan to come in, that's when I traded it. I traded it. What did I trade? Mazda. That's right. I had a Mazda for like three months. I had a Civic hatchback that I used as kind of a kind of a beater, a commuter. That I really thought it was a nice. It was only like a twenty, like a twenty-two thousand dollar car. And I just used that as a commuter for a while. I got into, in order, in order to afford that like 911 and the Hellcat that I had before, I had to really go cheap on my daily driver since I got the Civic. Wanted something a little bit nicer, I ended up trading that in on a Mazda, oh, it's all come back to me, a Mazda 3 hatchback. After driving that for a few months, I really didn't like it. And that's when I decided to go back to something nicer and I got the Macan. That's how, that's how the Macan came to be. Interesting. Okay, so while I waited for the Taycan to, to come in, I drove the I drove the Macan, and that's when I started having not issues with it, but things about that I didn't necessarily care for. So I traded the Macan in on this guy. Sorry, it's, it took me a second to remember. This, this was all a couple years ago. And then while I waited for this guy to come in, that's when it was like perfect timing. Yeah, that's right. That the that, 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 that the uh, Taycan came in. Okay, so I've been driving the Taycan for about the last eight months. And I honestly don't think I'll ever go back to an internal combustion motor vehicle as a daily driver. If you guys haven't ever driven an EV, you know, I'm not big on the whole uh, movement or the talking about saving the earth because really it causes more damage to the world or whatever to make an EV, whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not, I don't really follow that to be honest. So that's not why I drive an EV. I drive it because of the performance figures and the just the experience you get when driving it. I talked earlier about that Macan having like a delay yet at, at, at that roundabout almost every single day, and you don't get that with an EV. It's instant. It's, it's, it's as soon as you push, you know, the accelerator. It's, it's instant response. Even with the Taycan that I thought was underpowered, you just get that satisfaction of you know, an instant acceleration or instant instant braking, everything's really instant, even like remote start. These things all are pretty smart, so, you know, they come with these apps on your phone that you can, you can pre-heat or pre-cool the cabin, and if you were to restart a remote start like the, the Hummer or the Ram over there, for example, you're looking at a couple minutes, like five to ten probably before it gets up to temperature, especially on a day like this, it's, it's two degrees outside right now. And if I were to have this parked outside for like my work day, you know, it's time to leave. And all I would have to do with an internal combustion car is remote start it. And they usually have timers on those things. Like they, sometimes they shut off after like 10 minutes because that's honestly almost how long it takes for things to warm up for them. Plus there's I'm sure environmental regulations. But for this, this thing could be, you know, an ice cube outside to fully comfortable heated seats, heated steering wheel, everything defrosted, defogged, or de-iced. Honestly, within like two minutes, tops. Between the simplicity of you know just, just owning the vehicle for like, another, another thing, I had to get my wife's uh, what she got Wagoneer. I had to get her Wagoneer an oil change this weekend, and it was about almost I think about 500 miles over what they recommend for an oil change on that car, and that was because I couldn't I honestly couldn't get into a dealership. Around here, at least, I think it's because of people not wanting to work. 
but I wasn't able to get a, an express appointment because, well, the whole purpose of an express appointment is that you don't need an appointment actually. No places have the express lane open because they just don't have the staff to support it. So I had to call around to dealerships that I don't normally would go to just to get an, an oil change for her Wagoneer. The EV, you don't need an oil change because there's no, there's no oil in it. So the service requirements are very minimal compared to that of a normal car, which is nice. That's just a benefit. One thing that people talk about is, which I had no experience with until this year, because the Taycan, I didn't drive that for, it's like a first three or so months that I owned it. I just drove the Macan or while I had it and I was deciding what to do with it. But having experience in the winter now with an EV, I think that'd be the only, only negative thing I could think of when it comes to driving one. And that is the, the range does. I have a few friends who have uh, some Teslas, for example, and they talk about, oh yeah, the, the range is like half of that of what it normally is in the winter or summertime. And never really understood what they meant by that until this winter. And what, what that means is that, you know, in the summertime, all EVs, they have a recommended charging rate or charging limit, I guess you can call it. The Mercedes, for example, they, they, when I say they, I mean Mercedes, they recommend charging to, I believe it's 80%. The Porsche Taycan, that was 85%. And this is 80%. And that's just like for their fast charging. When I say they don't want you to charge to 100%, I don't mean that. They just say for the longevity or the, it's better for the batteries to not charge to 100% every single time. But in reality, that's really only gonna benefit like the second or third owner, I think. You know, because I'm not gonna keep this car, for example, for 100,000 miles. And charging to 100%, that's only really gonna affect the long term of the battery. So I'm really not doing myself any favors by limiting my, my distance I'm allowed to travel because of how much percentage of batteries charge. I'm just saving it for the next guy. It's whatever though. I I was I was able to uh, do a what they call a level two charger at my house, which is basically a 240 or 220 volt system that allows you to charge your your car at a, at a faster rate versus like a 110. Which all these cars, all these EVs, they come with a 110 charger. Some of them come with a 220 volt adapter too. So people like me who have the, the system in play, meaning the like the circuit and the plug-in and all that stuff, we can we can you know fast charge our EVs overnight and get you know from zero to 100 in eight hours versus the 110 something like that depending on the size of the battery would could take upwards of like a week. When it comes to range in the winter time, it really is about half of what I was experiencing in the summertime. For example, the Taycan, that would recommend it fill, uh, charging to 80 or 85, I forget one of the two, but whatever it was, I would be getting a range estimate of about 280 miles. So let's say it was 85%, I'd give it about 285 miles before she needed to be charged again. As soon as the temperature outside got below basically like basically 30 basically a freezing temperature that's when i noticed that the range not the percentage of the battery or even the amount that i used but the range did about cut be cut in half so that 85 percent battery at 285 miles would go down to about what was it? it was like 160 miles or something like that it was actually a pretty significant drop and i think that is the only gripe i have over the evs driving them as a daily now what you should do is if that's if you end up you know converting to this is do what i did and, and just get that in-home charging option because it's just like charging your phone you know you go to bed at night you plug your phone in and it's really no difference with the with the for the car, I just did here. One thing I like about about them too is that you can set the time that you want to charge. So, for example, for 
For me, I have Dakota Electric, and there's rates. There's, there's rate incentives to not charge during like the peak hours of the day, meaning from like 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. That's what they consider like the peak hours. Probably because that's when businesses are up and running. So you're gonna pay a lot more per kilowatt hour during that time of day than you would at night. So I, I signed up for this incentive program through Dakota Electric that gives me even a better rate because they they lock that that circuit or that zone away away from me until a certain time so even if i wanted to i couldn't charge my car before 11 p.m which took some getting used to because you know i, I work i get tired at night and i would oftentimes be asleep by 11 p.m so i couldn't do any of the of the programming for the Taycan. It had, it had profiles that it required you to set up for charging. They called them timers. That took a while for me to to figure out how to how to use that properly because it's 11 o'clock at night and I want to go to bed. So I'd often wake up during the middle of the night and that's when I would just go to the phone and program the, the charging sequences or charging timers. Anyway, so as long as you don't forget to you know, plug in your car when it's getting low on percentage, it's really not that big of a deal. I, I have to plug in, so I drive about, probably about 10 miles a day, just commuting to and from work, maybe a little bit more. So, and it's that, you can imagine, doesn't really take a whole lot of, I guess, battery percentage away every day. Except in the winter time, that, that 10 miles per day, and I could charge to 80% in the Taycan, and that'd be good for, almost three weeks, honestly, if I didn't go anywhere else. And because I'm charging between the hours where it costs the least amount, I'm able to set up the, uh, the analytics in my, in my app that shows me how much I'm actually spending to charge. And I was only spending like 25 bucks a month to charge the Taycan just, just to go to work. So the consumption that I was doing it, was, it made a whole lot more sense to drive the EV because gas prices were way up there and you know, I, was, I was spending like one-tenth the amount that I would have normally just to commute to work. Sorry if I'm sounding stuffed up. That's why I missed last week's video. I've been sick for the last almost two weeks. Still fighting it. So this car is supposed to get better range than the, than the Taycan and I think that I was until until so winter came, which is almost right when I started using this car. So when it was brand, brand new, you know, it charged to 80%, the range on it would be like 260. Now when I charge to 100%, the range is like 160. And that is, that is strictly because of the temperature, the ambient temperature outside. So if you take that into consideration, and the fact that you just need to charge more often, more than once a week, just because the, the amount of distance you can travel, drops because of the heat. It's really something that is manageable. But it's not all negative, you know. Like I said, I, I don't think I'll ever go back to an internal combustion motor as a as a daily driver, regardless of the amount of range that you sacrifice in the wintertime, because it is extremely easy for me, anyone really, to to work around that just by plugging the damn thing in. It's not that it's not complicated, it's not asking too much. I liked driving this so much. I teased on this in the previous video that I did end up trading the Taycan here about two months ago. That's why I've been driving this for the last, well, since I traded the Taycan actually. And I ended up trading it in on a BMW iX M60, which is BMW's all electric SUV. Now, I wasn't too crazy about that car when it first came out. I thought it was kind of strange looking, but I think everybody thought this was kind of strange looking too with those weird kidney shaped grills. And like that, the iX has grown on me quite a bit. And I enjoy driving this thing so much that the iX is supposed to be this thing on steroids. You know, it's not, it's not comparable as far as practicality goes because the iX is an SUV and this is a this is a hatchback, but the just the feeling of driving it and the, the quality of driving this 
I liked it so much more than the Taycan. And then also when I got that Taycan, if you guys saw that video, you'll remember that there was a few things I didn't like about it right away. Such as it looking like a wagon. I'm not a, I'm not a wagon fan. I just don't, I just don't like them. And that thing I couldn't, every time I looked at it, at certain angles, all I could see was a wagon. <laughs> so I justified that as the reason why uh, I was willing to trade it in because BMW, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive like Porsche. This thing, for example, is about, uh, how much was this thing? Upper 60s, I want to say. And, and for that, I got, got, a, I got a faster car. I got, I think, a smarter car. The app I thought was better than Porsche. The, I think it looks better than the Porsche. It definitely drives better and it's definitely faster too. Which if you buy an EV, that's kind of one thing that, that you buy it for is it's, it's speed. And I talk about that, that zero leg when it comes to driving and accelerating. You know, it's, it's really incredible. I'm gonna rinse this thing down real quick. It's been about two months since I applied this graphene coating from Adam. Look how well this stuff beads off. Make the drying process so easy so I'm gonna do that and then we'll keep on talking about about this car and then I'll actually show you guys around I gotta clean the inside still Man, I really like this car. Okay, I'm gonna dry it off real quick and then we'll keep on talking about her and this thing cleans up super nice that looks much better and having that coating on there sure made things a lot easier so let me t show you around a little bit about this car. This is a 2023 BMW i4 M50. For the i4 model, they have two, currently they have two trim levels that you can choose from for, uh, I guess, power. If you don't know BMW, they, they name their, their model range based off how much like power, the higher up, the higher the power. So they have an M40 and an M50. And I elected to go with the M50 option because just like you know, with Porsche, you go from the, the S to the, I guess it'd be the base, to the S, to the GTS, to the turbo, you end up getting more power with with, uh, with the increase in trim level, but you also get a lot of stuff standard from the from the, the lesser models. So I went with the M50 i4, and I like the, I like BMWs in white. They have kind of like that Stormtrooper look to them, plus they're just really clean looking. So I went with the mineral white. That is the metallic white that they offer, so it's not, um, just, just like a flat, I don't know if you can see that, but see how there's a little bit of a pearl flake in there. And I went with the with the M shadow line trim for the exterior. I don't know if, actually I don't know if there's another option for the M50, I'm drawing a blank. But the shadow line I know comes with it, like extended black, for example, like the, I believe the window trim is black versus like a, like a polished aluminum or a chrome, one of the two. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's that's what it is. Also with the exterior new, I think it's for this one year, there was a BMW 50 year anniversary emblem option. And it just came with this nifty little cool. So typically the BMW logo would be similar to what you see on the inside there. Inside the BMW here, that, that's, that's a standard BMW logo, but then they have this 50 year model. I think the wheels come with it too, yeah. Had that 50 year kind of short term option here so I wanted to go with that. Next on the outside I went with the parking assist package. This comes with front and rear sensors but the main reason why I did it is because I really like the 360 camera that comes on a lot of these newer cars. It, it gives you essentially like a bird's eye view. So there's a camera in the front there of the car so as you're pulling into a tight, tight spot or pulling into the garage you can see basically right down the side of your car or you're at a drive through for example you could turn that on You'll be able to see the curb. Not that you can't look out the window, but it just gives you another option. Next on the exterior, I did elect, because I do want to use this as a daily driver, and I have been. These are the 19-inch uh, all-season tires and wheels. I didn't want the ha to have the 20-inch uh, ones because you couldn't get a all-season tire with them. And because, I, I, I mean, I truth, 
be told, I don't really care for performance tires anyway. They're sticky. They just grab crap and fling it at your car. But I do need a, I did need the uh, tires to be usable in the winter time. So I went with both all seasons and the 19s. It gets you a little bit more range too, in theory, according to the website. If you select the 19 inch versus the 20, I think it's like a, probably only like maybe like a 5% increase, but that's pretty good considering. Next on the outside, I did go with the M carbon fiber package. I thought this was, BMW is usually pretty good when it comes to their options as far as uh, Costco. Like I'll talk about the inside, but this was a pretty expensive option. And all it came with was a little bit of carbon fiber on the, on the mirrors. This little extra, which I thought was nice. This little extra wing in carbon fiber. And then this rear diffuser also in carbon fiber. Otherwise it would have been just a gloss black. And y'all know me, I don't like gloss black on cars. Like I wish this was carbon fiber, but it's a nice little accent. I, however, I would rather it be carbon fiber because I just don't like gloss black. It scratches really easily, but more importantly, the carbon fiber looks really cool. That was the most expensive option on here besides going from the 40 to the 50 having this exterior carbon fiber trim pieces and you really don't get a whole lot. Like it would have been nice if there was more besides like, like this should have been carbon fiber for example, but it's just gloss black. I do like that this lower rocker is a matte plastic instead of gloss black because your calf or your shin, or if you're a little kid, or your, uh, your shoes are gonna end up hitting that. There is this little piece too in the front that's also part of that carbon fiber package. I don't think it's worth the price. I think BMW, like I said earlier, they're really good on option costs, but this was a pretty expensive option that I don't know if it was worth. I would do it again, but I just think it was expensive. And then last on the outside, I did what's called the BMW, I believe it's like an Icon laser headlight. I mean, it's, it's nice and bright and the lines are crisp, but I don't know if it's any brighter than the normal headlights. That was a, also an expensive option, that was about a thousand bucks. And then moving on to the inside, I talked about options being pretty affordable. This right here, to bring the carbon fiber from the outside inside, I did select the carbon fiber interior package. This is only like 300 bucks, but you get carbon fiber along the entire dash, and it looks really sporty, I feel. I did not realize that the steering wheel came with this two-tone stitching. Another option I picked was, I believe it's pronounced Vernesca. It's a upgraded interior leather package. Typically this would come with what I think it's called Sensitec or something like that. It's like a fake leather. I just thought that it felt really cheap and I, I, I sounds weird, but I smelt one of the cars that had that Sensitec in it and I was not crazy about the smell of it. So this, uh, this Vernesca leather was an option as a, as an upgrade, kind of expensive, about 1500 bucks, but it came with, you know, this, the stitch dash and stuff like that. But what I was going to say is I did not know that the steering wheel came with this two tone uh, stitching that was an option to get on these seats had it had the ability to do this again or had I known that that came with that stitching I would have selected that option on these seats as well why I didn't no idea I don't know I just thought I like black seats or dark seats and things that take attention from them not really a fan of but again had I known this little number would have been there I would have pushed it through with the BMW EVs you get little blue accents throughout so uh, you know, a little logo on the steering wheel, the shifter and the power button, those have that blue accent. Also on the inside, I did select the, the Harman Kardon uh, in audio. I love audio in cars. This brings me to the iX that I have built. I did go through with that uh, upgraded audio on that one, so that'll be pretty sweet. But the Harman Kardon here is really pretty high end, I think. Still have the protection on the screen naturally, but you get this huge display that's not I kind of wish it was more built into the dash, kind of like the Porsche was, but I don't know, this, this looks really nice. It's not just like an iPad sitting on the dash. It's all, you know, one giant deal. But more importantly, as you're sitting here in this position, you're not getting things blocked. Like I can see the time and the mileage and all that good stuff that you want to see. I'm not crazy about how the way the door sounds when you shut it. That was a good shut, but it's, it, it's, it's almost something in here that like pulls it away or pulls it in. Okay, see, so unless you unless you know that, if you just if you just shut it like that, you hear all kind of gross that sounded. It's gonna both slam and sound really weird. But as long as you know that, you kind of just give it a gentle push. It sounds okay. This was the last minute idea that I thought I would have. With you know, once in a while, you follow on the YouTube rabbit hole, you find like dash cams. There was an option to have what's called a dry recorder. See if I can focus on that. There we go. That there just records. I haven't messed around with that honestly, but that just records 
you're driving, similar to like a dash cam. And then the last couple options that I selected, one was a, I'm surprised this was even an option, but there is a wireless charging pad, which I'll talk about here once I'm done. But that was one item that was like 200 bucks. Also got the premium package, which is kind of nice, but it, it's, everything's done through the screen, but um, heated and cooled front seats, which is what need, I think you needed to select this leather anyway, if you wanted those, that cooled seat. What is that? So I know that was kind of a quick video, but I wanted to show you guys a little bit around the i4. I think this is a really great car. It's not that expensive. MSRP on it was, I thought it was uh, upper 60s, but it was actually upper 70s, which is still, I mean, 30 grand cheaper than the Taycan, and I enjoy this car more than the Taycan. If you recall, there was one angle of it that I didn't care for, and this just looks like a normal car. See, I wouldn't look at this and think it's a hatchback, but I need the hatchback again for the cargo room, but this is a great looking car in all angles, I think. I can't really find one angle that I don't care for. I mentioned that I did the wireless charging pad. Things about things this car that stand out to me compared to the Taycan, not, not to turn this into a Taycan versus i4 because they are in two different leagues. Even things such as the you know wireless pad. This is easily accessible just right here. I just throw my phone there and it charges right away. The Taycan, I had to put it in my center console face that way, like facing that way, and it still didn't even catch half the time. It was really kind of a poor design in my opinion. <laughs> My position here, I can see everything that I want to see. The steering wheel on the Taycan was blocking, like, like I couldn't imagine this, like not being able to see the time. In order to see the time, I had to either come this way or come that way. And it's a really comfortable car too. The Taycan, this B pillar was so far up and the bolster on the seat was so far up that you essentially had to almost fall into it. My dad, I've been having to bring him to some appointments lately and it was hard to see him try to get in the car. That was another reason why I sold the Taycan was in case I needed to bring him places. But the dash would come out so much, the bolsters would come out so much and this B-pillar was just huge. He was struggling to get in the car and that made me realize, hey, I'm struggling too because just the way that it's set up, this thing is just, everything's nice and flat. In fact, I wish that these seats were a little bit more bolstered, but you know, it is what it is. It's a lot easier to get in and out of. For sure. So if I had to pick between the two, I mean, I think we all know I, as I got rid of the Taycan, but I'll definitely take this over the Porsche Taycan. Again, can't really compare the two, but it's all I have to compare against because I haven't bought anything else like a Tesla or anything like that. And uh, I don't, I'm not ever going to, by the way, unless something changes with their looks and their quality. With BMW and Porsche and Mercedes coming out with these, what you would expect, high-end electric vehicles that look and perform the way that they do, I don't see uh, that changing anytime soon. As I said before, I do have an iX coming in. I did trade the Taycan in on an iX M60, and uh, it's, it's, it'll probably be here in April. I'm not, I'm not gonna spill what color it is yet. I think it's something really sweet. Uh, you guys have probably seen the color, but it, it, I think it'll complement the stable really well. If you haven't put two and two together, I, my cars, so these are my dad's and mine, uh, my cars, you can see tend to be more bland in color. For example, the Camaro, Challenger, 992, C, uh, C6, those are all my cars. Him and I own together the Viper, the R8, the 488, and the Hummer over here. You can see those are more of a, what some would probably say bland colors. He likes the ones that are, that are a little bit brighter and stand out. He also likes the white, you know, that's, the, the S65 is his, so is that 911 and the Vanquish and the SLS. But we're not really big into the whole look at me. Like when I sourced the ZL1, for example, I like that 1LE package, but I don't want, I'm not going to be driving it on the track or anything like that. So I wanted something that blended in a little bit more, a little bit less attention seeking or look at me, if you will. I'm going to wash this car. I think it's trash. Well, no, that don't, but because it's white. But look at this film of dust on there. You see that? Yuck. Poor Camaro. So, just to give you an idea of what's coming in the iX, obviously it's not going to be a bright blue or green SUV. It'll be nice and boring. Wow, it's actually past 2 o'clock. i got to get ready for a Christmas party here. Sorry about not doing anything last week. I think I said earlier, I was, I'm just getting over like a almost a two-week something. It wasn't, wasn't strep, wasn't COVID. I don't know what it was, but it really kicked my ass and uh didn't stop me from going to work but 
as soon as I got home from work, I would just pass out right away. So with that being said, hope you guys are all staying healthy, having a good holiday season so far. I'm gonna end this video here. Tell me what you guys think about this EV. What do you guys think the future is gonna be like for EVs? I'm, I'm predicting, see how far they've come in the last even five years. What's gonna be 10 years from now, 20 years? We're gonna probably see cars this size getting just, I mean, what can you really do besides more performance and more range? That's probably about as far as they can take it, but I'm excited to see where, where, where they do take it. The Taycan was expensive, it was nice, it looked pretty cool, but there were just things about it that, I mean, granted it was Porsche's first EV that I know they can only get better on or improve on, but for BMW to come out with something like this, you know, they came out swinging, and I think this is a very high benchmark for someone like even like Tesla to to try to try to beat. All right, I gotta stop rambling because I gotta get going, so I will end this video here. As always, I appreciate you guys watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks. You guys hear that? That's the sound this thing makes when it when it's driving. Okay, so here's a roundabout I'm going through. This is what I'm talking about. Like, let's say I just want to kick out of this roundabout. Nice and quick. It just takes no effort.